The Georgia football roster is in flux. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, talking dogs. We got uh, got Palmer Toms on the line from uh, Dogs 247 Sports to help us uh, break down Georgia football uh, in the aftermath of a win in the Sugar Bowl over Baylor. Palmer, how are you doing tonight? Doing well. It was an exciting win over the Baylor Bears in New Orleans, and it's been you know quite the offseason so far. You, you know, we're just letting almost – you haven't even played the national championship game. So it's not off season for college football, you know, but um, Georgia's had, you know, lots of turnover on the roster and excited to break it all down. Yeah. Before we break it down, let's go back to what happened in new Orleans over Baylor, jumping out to a big lead 19 to nothing. Uh, Baylor got back in the game and Georgia was certainly the superior team, despite tons of players missing that game. Uh, and that made it difficult for many of us to prognosticate the game, but uh, Georgia's superior depth, talent, speed, so forth, obviously took hold. And especially that defense, um, it wasn't the ending of the season that uh, many had hoped for the last couple of years, going to the sugar bowl, losing the sec championship game, but at least in response and in comparison to what happened last season against Texas has to feel good that uh, this team uh, stepped up and, and completed the deal. Absolutely. I mean, being in New Orleans for, you know, a couple of days leading up to that game, there was certainly a different level of focus, um, you know, surrounding the team, you know, in, in the interviews, you know, at practice, the, it was different than it had a very different feeling than what it was uh, in 2018, you know, the 2018, 2019 Sugar Bowl. Um, with, you know, them taking on Texas. Um, a lot of guys that weren't there. You had, you know, the two early entries to the NFL draft that we'll discuss, offensive tackle um, in Andrew Thomas and Isaiah Wilson. Um, we'll break that all down. But, um, you know, had those guys, had a couple guys missing for, you know, off the field issues. So, you know, it was it was interesting to see Georgia, you know, go and, and Kirby Smart be, you know, be very, you know, for, forthcoming with it and saying, you know, hey guys, we're not. You know, if if we have to leave a guy at home this year, or leave him back in Athens. You know, that's fine. We want to take the guys that are ready to play. We want to take the guys that are. You know, it, it doesn't matter if they've been a starter all year or you know have been on the bench. Uh, the guys that are focused to play, the guys that are going to come to play, and you know. So with that being said, you saw a lot of younger guys playing. You know, obviously DeAndre Swift was there. He had an NFL decision coming up. He hadn't made it at the time. Um, but he was also dealing with some injuries stuff. He got one carry, um, was in for, I believe, three plays. Um, you know, and, and he he was very adamant the whole week. I want to play in this game. I'm doing my best. You know, I, I, he's, he was one of Georgia's four team captains. And so, you know, got to take his word for that, that he really, really wanted to play in that game. Um, but because of his injuries, because of, you know, anything else, we saw a lot of um, Zamir White, Kenny McIntosh, James Cook, um, and so, you know, really got a great look at the future of the posi- running back position at Georgia. Um, Zamir White had career high, 18 carries, 92 yards, uh, scored a touchdown in that game. Um, Kenny McIntosh, true freshman for the Bulldogs, looked great um, in his, you know, he had been kind of the fifth running back this year. And, you know, there were times that he looked like he very well could have been the first next year. So, um, you know, a lot of, lot of exciting things to see out of the youth. Um, and I, I think that would be, you know, the youth being headlined by George Pickens is 12 receptions, 175 yards, touchdown, uh, MVP performance. And so I think there was a lot of positive to be taken out of that game. Um, you saw, you know, you saw growth going into the offseason. You saw, you know, some of these younger guys that are going to have to take on bigger roles um, in 2020 being forced into that for the sugar bowl and, you know, having to prove themselves on a big stage before the off season even happens. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. This is what we do each and every day. Even during the off season is talk college football with the best of bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry. We are here all the time. So lock it in, like uh, comment, uh, share the videos and subscribe. Got Palmer Thomas on the line from dogs, two, four, seven with so much going on around the Georgia football program. We know that Kirby smart is still the head coach, but other than that, uh, comings and goings all over the place. So let's get to it with Jake Fromm. Certainly he piled up his detractors uh, to a certain extent because he couldn't quite get Georgia to the promised land and bring home the national championship. But he came oh so close in 2017, and that might have been his undoing was he came oh so close as a freshman 
and then the following two seasons, uh, losing in the SEC championship game despite playing extremely well against Bama in 2018. Uh, just your thoughts about Jake Fromm, his readiness for the NFL, and and his legacy there at Georgia. Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head there. I think um, you know because of what happened in his freshman year, that was kind of the story that was looming over him every game that he played. It was, hey, this kid, you know, started as a freshman, led them to an SEC championship, led them to a Rose Bowl victory, and was oh so close to, you know, just he, he did everything he could to win that national championship. Um, ultimately, it came down to the defensive. You know, defense getting a stop in overtime, and you know we know we all know how that one ended. And so I think it with as long as Jake Fromm was going to be at Georgia, the storyline with him was is he going to be able to get redemption for that you know 2018 national championship loss? And so you know that really weighed on him. Um, from an outsider's perspective, it looked like that weighed on him, um, especially you know, and he, he had so much transition in the offense. Um, new offensive coordinator this year and James Coley coming in in replacement of Jim Chaney. Um, tons and tons of new wide receivers. You know, you saw the transition at running back felt like, you know, seemingly constant transition going from Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle to Elijah Holyfield and DeAndre Swift. Well, Swift comes back, but then Brian Herrian takes on a bigger role and, you know, et cetera. You've got so much transition, so much change happening around him. But the one constant about Georgia the past three seasons has always been Jake Fromm at the quarterback position. So having started over 40 plus games, you know, you kind of felt like it, it seemed like they had peaked with him. Um, you know, almost hit a plateau. Um, you know, and it was just they weren't getting any better. Um, you know, he, he was getting the job done. They were winning games, but it, it wasn't pretty. Um, and so, you know, that, that by no means does that all fall on Jake. But a lot of, you know, the offense, you know, you put a lot of that pressure and stress on the quarterback. And so I think the way that this 2019 season finished with the offense not really playing well in the last seven, eight games, um, him, you know, not in the final, I believe it was five games of the regular season, not topping, um, you know, 50% completion percentage. Uh, you know, he was really, really struggling. And so, you know, to see the way that he finished out the season going 20 of 30, 250 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions against Baylor was great considering, you know, no, understanding and fully knowing what he has done over his three year career at Georgia. Um, you know, he, he took over the team, you know, week one, you know, with Jacob Eason going down and um, you know, is really leaving Georgia in a better place than when he found it and took it over in, week one of 2017. Absolutely. He should be credited with what he accomplished there at Georgia again within an eyelash of a national championship in 2017, three division championships, three SEC championship games, playing well in most of those games, a tremendous Rose Bowl effort against Oklahoma, an SEC championship game in 2018 that he can be proud of and taking on Alabama and putting up 28 points and having a lead in the fourth quarter of that particular game. And he finishes off with a bowl win against Baylor and he threw 78 touchdowns. And I believe I've got the record here in my head at 35 and seven over three years is what I came up with. Palmer seems pretty close, like 12 and two, 11 and three, 12 and two. That would make that right. Yeah. And so, yeah, Jake from an exceptional career, Georgia, wish him all the best because uh, I, I'm not close to the situation, but based on what I see on the field and what I hear about him off the field certainly seems to be an upstanding guy that's going to put in his best to, to try to be uh, a fine NFL quarterback. So I wish him the best, certainly. Um, and it certainly couldn't have helped in regards to the comparisons made once uh, Georgia fans were looking up to the Big Ten and Justin Fields and what he was doing and throwing 41 touchdown passes for the number one team in the country. That that certainly, I'm sure, didn't help Jake's cause either. Oh, yeah. And and I mean, it's it's frustrating for Georgia fans to see that. But, you know, you at the same time, you've got to understand completely different offensive schemes, completely different styles of football, you know. I, I don't know that Justin Fields would have been putting up those same numbers in the Georgia offense. I, I really don't believe that he would because, you know, you look at how much success Georgia has had with, you know, the running game and, you know, no disrespect to JK Dobbins at all, but, you know, Georgia is, is the kind of team that wants to, you know, control the clock and, 
you know, wear you down. And, you know, and that, you know, means that you're going to get a lot of carries for your running backs. And, and I, I'm, again, also no disrespect to the Big Ten, but, you know, the defenses you're seeing in the SEC these days, you know, you're playing against some of the best teams in the country, best defenses in the country. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think to a lot of Georgia fans, it was frustrating to understand that, hey, we had, you know, we had Justin Fields and now we don't. And, you know, he's up at Ohio State putting up the big numbers, you know, being a Heisman Trophy finalist. And, you know, who knows what will happen with him next year, um, leading his team to the playoffs this year. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of Georgia fans came around at the end of the season and kind of realized that that maybe Justin may not have had the same kind of success if he had been at Georgia. And, you know, with the, with the wide receiver weapons and, you know, everything that has changed around Jake Fromm, there was a lot of just t- pure talent around um, fields up at Ohio State. And so, you know, trade those places with those guys. Obviously, Fromm isn't nearly as much of a dual threat guy as fields. But, you know, you were seeing wide receivers get wide open. They were catching balls that were on their hands. You didn't see that at Georgia. And so, you know, trade places. I don't know that Jake Fromm puts up the exact same stats, but I feel like he very well could have been putting up better stats than he did this year at Georgia, um, just given, you know, the talent around him and the offensive scheme. No question about that. Um, And and certainly it's going to be interesting now with Jamie Newman coming in from Wake Forest, uh, a dual threat guy who ran for almost 600 yards and six touchdowns at Wake, uh, had vied for the starting position this season prior to as a sophomore, but as a junior, racked up 26 touchdowns and 11 picks, about a 61% passer. Uh, I've seen him play several times. He, He doesn't look to be like one of the very best quarterbacks in the nation, but we'll see again, he's going to go from wake forest where he had some decent playmakers, but he's going to be upgraded considerably at Georgia. We'll see what they do with the offense and trying to mold it to his skills versus what they had with from. And it's just an interesting fit. And we'll see what he has there in Athens. Your thoughts about uh, Jamie Newman. Yeah. It's an interesting guy to bring in to me. Um, You know, you've, you've seen four years of Kirby smart as the, head coach and you look at who the quarterbacks have been. You had Jacob Eason first year. You know, obviously he's not necessarily he's not necessarily a dual threat guy. He's got a big arm. Um you've and then you've had from the past three. And you know, we addressed that just then, you know, that he's not a dual threat guy. Now you're bringing in Newman. Um kind of fits exactly what Kirby Smart said he wanted when he came in. He said we want a dual threat guy. Well he just hasn't had the you know the best quarterback that he's had each year hasn't been a dual threat guy. And so there's a good chance that Jamie Newman is going to be the best quarterback that he has next year. Um, certainly the most experienced quarterback having, you know, starting experience um, at Wake Forest. No guys on George's roster will have any starts under their belt. Um, you'll have Stetson Bennett returning for a red shirt junior year, former walk-on. He's been the backup. Um, he played at Juco. Uh, his, he, he was a red, so red shirted as a walk-on his first year in Athens went to JUCO, um, and then returned to Georgia after Fields left. Um, and, you know, Kirby Smart just wanted to have three guys uh, for spring practice in 2019. So, um, you know, he played the backup role. You have Dwan Mathis, who is coming off of a true freshman year that he didn't get any playing time. He, you know, had a cyst removed him from his brain. Um, in May following spring practice, he, you know, was able to go through spring drills, play in the spring game, um, looked pretty good in the, in, you know, his showing in the spring, but, you know, obviously he didn't get any live action in games as he was recovering from surgery and, you know, he was able to practice, but was never fully cleared for contact, um, did not play in games. We talked to him after the SEC champion, or excuse me, after the sugar bowl, um, and, he felt confident that he would be back for 2020, um, but he's still just awaiting the word that he's fully cleared. So we'll see if that happens before spring practice, before fall camp. You know, we, there's really no telling on the timeline there. And then they'll bring in Carson Beck as well at quarterback. Um, he'll be a true freshman out of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, he, you know, won the state championship his um, junior year won Mr. Football in the highest classification there in Florida. And so, you know, he's, he's gone up against talent, you know, his entire high school career was an elite 11 quarterback, but, you know, 
and, and, and early enrolled at Georgia. He was here for bowl practices as well. Um, so he got, you know, sometime around the offense, sometime around, you know, these guys. But, you know, the, nothing is like a college football experience. Um, and, you know, for a guy to come in after having started for a full season at, you know, an ACC school, they were, you know, Wake Forest looked like one of the better teams in the ACC with eight wins this year. Um, you know, probably second or third behind uh, Clemson. They, you know, playing in that same division, they weren't able to play for the ACC championship. But, um, you know, he looked like one of the better quarterbacks in the ACC this year. So it'll be interesting to see for sure, um, see how second-year offensive coordinator James Coley might change some things up with, you know, with a new guy in. Um, <clears throat> I, I think he, he preached to us, you know, that before the season that it's it's players, not plays. You you When you're designing plays and stuff, you design it around players. You don't design it around a play because you don't know what you're going to see on defense you know, in any given play. You know what players are going to be out there for your team. So, you know, for, for him, he's going to have a dual threat guy um, in Newman. He'll, he's going to be able to early enroll or enroll in as a graduate transfer, um, go through spring drills, you know, get that extra time on campus. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, Georgia also does have one head, one coaching position left on um, available open after Scott Fountain, the special teams coordinator, uh, took a job at Arkansas with former Georgia offensive line coach Sam Pittman now as the head coach there. So it'll be interesting to see what Georgia does with that head with that assistant coaching position open. Um, they they could just you know simply replace that special teams coach with another special teams coach. They could you know move some guys around on the staff. Uh, tight ends coach Todd Hartley has some experience coaching special teams in his in his past. Um, and so, you know, they may opt to bring in another offensive coach um, and, you know, a, a, a special, you know, you saw what LSU did this year with Joe Brady coming in as the passing game coordinator, bringing some, you know, different unique things to that offense. Georgia may look to do the same with that coaching opening. 